so we appreciate your sowing of seeds. I'm going to release the baby's Bible class. You guys can go off to your celebration, and we're going to jump into the, the last um, session of our series called Knowing God's Will, and some sources suggest that we make an average of 35,000 decisions a day. We have about 35,000 choices that we make a day. Now, that's not including the seven hours or six hours or eight hours that you get to sleep. So they say it's about 2,000 decisions an hour. I don't know how, who decided to sit down and try to work this thing out. So even now in my 30-minute sermon, my 25-minute sermon, you've got to be faced with the choice of do I take my iPhone out and flick and scroll through my notifications on my phone? Or maybe should I pick my nose or go to the bathroom and actually blow my nose? Or should I keep my face mask over my nose and mouth during the sermon or should I just drop it down? <laughs> decisions, decisions. We are faced with them all the time. And um, some decisions are obviously bigger than others. I always grew up with someone saying to me, Paul, the two biggest decisions you'll make in your life are who you marry and the career you decide to choose. If you get one of them wrong, it's going to affect the happiness of either your family life or your work life. So please make an important, uh, make the, the right decision when it comes to those big decisions. But we make decisions that don't just affect us, but they affect our loved ones and people around us. John Maxwell said, life is a matter of choices. Every choice you make makes you. So there's a lot of pressure on us to make the right decision. I don't know why the, the screens have disappeared, but we also face then the, the anxiety that comes with decision making. And there is a, a thing called the paradox of choices. Who knows, has anyone watched a, the, oh dear, has anyone watched the TED talk by I can't remember the guy's name, but he talks about the paradox of choices. You would think having more choices would be better, but sometimes they, they say when you have too many choices, it actually makes decision-making that much harder. So they say if you are deciding what shares to buy for your retirement fund and your financial advisor gave you 50 portfolios to choose from, most people that have so many choices feel overwhelmed and they then struggle to make the decision, so they put it off and put it off and end up not making the decision. Where if your financial advisor gave you five choices to choose from, decision-making can be so much simpler and easier. So we have the paradox of choices, too many choices that we face today. And then we have this illusion of perfection. So you can go off to the supermarket and go and buy a salad dressing. And when you go to the, the counter, there are 20 different types of salad dressing. Lots of choice. Now I get to choose the perfect salad dressing. So looking at them, looking at the different makes and, and flavors, I choose one and I go home and I put it on my salad that evening and I start eating my salad and in the back of the mind, I'm thinking there was probably a better salad dressing for me to choose. Even though it was a good salad dressing, you still are expecting perfection when it comes to the choice of your salad dressing. So we live with this anxiety of, am I making the right decision? When I look at social media and I see the lives of other people and what they're doing, did I make the right decisions? Even though your decisions were good and even though your decisions were right. And we want to trust for a generation of believers and, and young people who can develop the skill of making right decisions. So we could go and you could Google how to make um, correct, decision, uh, the correct decisions, and there are books about this. So the first one, they would say, identify the decision, gather relevant information, identify the alternatives, weigh the evidence, choose among the alternatives, take action, and then re review your decision. So there's lots of resources available for you to help you learn how to make decisions. But what do we do as a believer of Christ, as a follower of Christ, who has given your life to the Lord and, say, and said, I make you the Lord of my life. Everything I have belongs to you. And now as a Christian, I want to make the correct decisions in line with your will. So the series has been called Knowing God's Will. And we've had fun looking at the different dimensions of God's will. 
Um, many Christians, I believe today, are sometimes looking for God's will for a decision because they want someone else to make the decision for them. They actually don't want to take that responsibility of making the decision. They want someone else to make the decision so that you can blame the other person for when things don't go the way you thought they would go. Yes? How many of you have stood in front of a doctor or a mechanic and they've given you um, three different diagnoses? Um, option A, the benefits is this and the risk is this. Option B, the benefit is this and the risk is that. And option C, the benefit is this and the risk is this. And um, you say to the doctor or to the mechanic, but what would you do? Um, you make the decision for me. And the doctor looks at you and, and says, but I'm not you. You have to be the one that makes the decision. And I want to trust that God gives us the wisdom to make right decisions. And we've looked at not just making correct decisions, but God wanting to, to change you into the person and become the person that God wants you to become so that you can also make the right decisions. So we looked at God's sovereign will, we looked at his moral will, and we looked at his individual will, ways of descri describing God's will for our lives. We then looked at the traditional and contemporary view of the individual will. It, does God have an individual will for my life? And the, as we looked at last uh, two weeks ago, the view of the traditional view that primarily talks about, no, it's in God's moral will and it's only found in Scripture, and the contemporary view that says, yes, there are extra biblical revelation of finding God's will, individual will for your life. Let me just remind you that any extra biblical revelation won't contradict God's word. So there is no special little star next to that verse that says, go to the back of the Bible, Paul, and flick to the last page. And there in the, the back of the Bible, there's a picture of your face. And guess what? You are exempt from this moral will of God in Scripture. You can do what you want to do. No, God leads us and guides us through His word. My decisions are filtered by God's word. I, I, I did this quote by Billy Graham that says, if you are ignorant of God's word, you will always be ignorant of God's will. So I encourage you to spend time in scripture, spend time studying his word, study his moral word and live, living out the moral will of God for your life. Then if God does speak to you in an, another way or he leads you by peace or he gives you another revelation of a decision you have to make, may you have the wisdom then to know what to do. So we looked at different examples of if, if you believe that life is about following different dots and if you get the wrong decision, if you, if you make the wrong choice, that the picture, ultimate picture of what your life is going to look like. And we, instead of looking at God's sovereign will and moral will and in the moral will, there's just this individual will for you, we've rather looked at it as there is this area of freedom in God's moral will to make wise choices or make wise decisions, that God has given you free will. And there are times when you do not get a straight answer from Him. If it doesn't contradict His word, if it doesn't contradict the moral will of God, and it is a non-moral decision you have to make, there are times where He gives you that choice. And I trust that you have the wisdom. So today I want to close off this series with five questions to help you know God's will for your life when making non-moral decisions. Now, all of you are facing, potentially facing a decision today. I want you to put that decision aside and just listen to these five questions I want to ask you and then see how those five questions may relate to the decision that you are looking to make. There are times when I've looked back over my life and I've made a decision that wasn't the best decision, and I wish that I had someone that came along and asked me a question. You know when someone comes to you after you made the, after you made the decision and asks you a question, and, and you go like, why didn't you ask me that before I made the decision? You just brought in a whole other angle that I just did not see. I did not even think about that. I didn't even think about those consequences to the decision that I was going to make. So we realize that it's important to ask these questions, good questions. So my first question that I would like you to remember when it comes to discerning God's will in a decision is to look in the mirror and say, what do I really want? Why do I want to make this decision? 
Why am I behaving like this? Why do I want to behave like this? See, we all have a decision-making grid. We have these questions in this grid that we ask ourselves whenever we make a decision, like, am I going to like this? Is this going to make me happy? Is this going to make someone else happy? You know, sometimes I make decisions not to make me happy, but to please someone else. And I have to get to the root of why do I want to make this decision? Will anybody find out if I make this decision? Will this hurt me? Could this become a problem down the road? Can I afford this? I want to buy that car, but why do I want to buy that car? Really? The really at the end of this question, maybe we need to add. What do I really want, really? And this looks at our heart motives, the motives of our heart, why we are looking to make certain decisions. See, I can fool those around me, and I've learned in my marriage that I can sell a decision to my wife in a way that isn't always honest in the really behind why I want this decision. And, and, and my wife has a nose for sniffing out, but... And then when she finds out that there was this hidden agenda, why I wanted to go there on holiday, or why I wanted to do that, then... Yeah, then... <laughs> so be honest with yourself. If you can, take a moment to sit with the Lord and say, God... What is my motivation, my real motivation for wanting this or wanting um, your guidance in discerning your will for this decision? Am I just wanting to make this decision or do I just want to know your will so I can consider it or do I really want to live according to your will in this decision? Second question, sorry about our small projectors today, I'm not too sure what is happening here. Can someone help me in the back? Second decision is, am I seeking God's kingdom first? And I was actually chatting to Craig, sitting over here after the service, I think the first week, and he he said to me, well, when it comes down to it, when it comes down to knowing, knowing God's will, is, am I seeking God's kingdom first? And this was like the elephant in the room question. As a believer of Christ, this Um, A verse comes from Matthew 6, verse 33, and it says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. As a follower of Christ, as someone who has said, I make you Lord of my life, I live for you and your purposes, everything I have belongs to you, my gifts, my talents, my time. Um, Am I living for his kingdom Am I seeking his kingdom first, or am I seeking my kingdom first? So he says, and all these other things will be added unto you. Sometimes all the other things that will be added unto you, I seek first. And my question to you in this decision that you are making today, the decision that you want to make, is are you being obedient to this call of Jesus that says, seek first my kingdom above all else? And then all these other things will be added unto you. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to come after me, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. What does that mean for us in our decision making? What does it mean to seek his kingdom first? And it's always nice and easy to say, seek his kingdom first. But what does that look like? What does that look like when we have family Sunday last week? And what does it look like when... I look at people and I say, thank you, God, for putting those natural gifts and those spiritual gifts in their lives, and then looking at the need around us, the need in this world, and saying, God, we want to position ourselves here to see your kingdom advance. We want to be a part of the solution in what you, your mandate is for this earth. A.W. Tozer said, I am thy servant to do thy will, and, what, and that will is sweeter to me than position or riches or fame, and I choose it above all things on earth or in heaven. I don't know how many of us can say, God, doing your will, walking in your will, for me is sweeter than fame, fortune, and all the things that we seek after first in our lives. Third question that I want you to ask is, have I pursued wisdom? Ephesians 5 verse 15 to 17 says this, 
So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, don't, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. You just have to spend some time in Proverbs, and you have to see how Proverbs talks about the fool and the wise. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. I'm not just saying that um, we, obviously we all make some foolish decisions, but, but a fool is someone who willfully does what is unwise. And he tells us in this passage to not act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants us to do. And I don't know how many of you have watched a session by Andy Stanley called The Best Question Ever. How many of you have watched that old teaching that he does called The Best Question Ever? Does anyone know The Best Question Ever? He says this, and this is, I've, I've practiced this principle for many years. This is a, 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 a couple of sentences that I've memorized. And when it comes to decision making, I ask these three things. Here it is. In light of my past, my present situation, and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? Sorry, this um, computer's still giving me issues. In light of my past, my present situation, and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? Sometimes we're not just looking for what is the correct or the right answer, or the correct decision to do, but we need to ask the question, what is the wise thing to do? So he starts by saying, in light of my past, each of us have got a different past, we've got different strengths and weaknesses, we've had different experience, experiences, so in light of my past, let's say I'm not good with managing money, and let's say I've, I've really struggled when it comes to finances, and I keep finding myself in debt, and I keep spending money I don't have, and this has been a pattern in my life. So if I have a decision to make about the bank phoning me and saying, would you like the new credit card? I have to ask myself the question, in light of my past track record when it comes to managing money and debt and being wise when it comes to spending, and my present situation. So right now, I am just about out of debt. I've got a couple more payments to make, and then I'm debt-free in light of my present situation, and in light of my future hopes and dreams, my future hopes and dreams being that my family doesn't have to live with this burden of debt anymore, that we can make choices to start saving and saving, saving for our retirement and maybe going on an overseas trip. In light of my future hopes and dreams, what then is the wise thing to do? Should I take the credit card or not take, take the credit card? Taking a credit card, well, this is debatable. Um, is it right or wrong? But getting a credit card should be fine. But in light of my past, in light of my present situation, in light of my future hopes and dreams, is it wise for me to get it? So remember this. When it comes to decisions you make, because this is the verse, Ephesians 5 verse 17, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. God, give us the wisdom to make wise choices. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Next question I want you to ask. Number four, have I received wise counsel? Proverbs 11 verse 14 says this, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. And the reason why I put this padlock here is if you have counselors, spiritual guidance, a community of believers, people in your life that you can go to and say, won't you stand with me as we pray about this decision? Won't you help me seek God's wisdom and guidance in this decision? Won't you help me see if there are any red flags when it comes to making this decision? Where there is an abundance of counselors, there is safety. And I listened to a teaching that um, Carl gave me from OC Africa, and the guy was talking about he was on a boat, and he was going through the Panama Canals, and it was the middle of the night, and the guy says, the only way we're going to get this right by going through the canals is we have to see these three lights that are on the horizon all lined up. 
And, and he used this in a, as an illustration about God's guidance and decision making, that these three things have to be in line. If they're not in line, we wait. We don't go through in the darkness of the night through the canals because we're going to have a problem. So he says there came a point in the positioning of the, the ship where those three beacons lined up perfectly and they could start heading through. And he talks about the three lights being these three things. One, an open door. Who knows that you can't go through a closed door? Two is God's peace in the situation. And three is the counsel that comes from the abundance of counselors. So let me give you three examples, and I want to see if you can help me make a decision here. Example number one, there is an open door or an opportunity for me. I have peace about this open door or opportunity, but my counselors that I go to, that I'm submitted to and I live life in relationship, are waving red flags saying, we see red lights. What do you do? Do you wait and pray some more and say, God, well then, let's get these three lights in line so that we can make this decision and go? Or do we say, forget those people, we out of here. Example number two, there is an open door for your life and your family. Your counselors, the people in your, in your community are saying, yeah, it looks good. On the outside, it looks good, but you don't have a peace. What do you then do? Wait till your peace comes, I hope. Because some people say, I'm going to pray for you, brother. Praying for you, but they're not praying for you. And when they give you an answer, it may just be a, a decision that may not be God's heart for the situation. Maybe number three is maybe a little closer to home. You have an open door, you have a peace, but guess what? Your spouse doesn't have the peace. What do you do? I believe God's not a God of disorder. He's not going to tell my wife one thing and me something else. So one of us better go back and get on their knees and hear God correctly. What is the motive of your heart? Why are you saying this, love? Because he's saying something different to me. But let's get on the same page and hear what God is saying so we can make this decision together. And question number five that I want you to ask yourself when it comes to decision making is, when it comes to actually making the decision and then trusting God through the decision, does this decision contradict God's word? Does it contradict his moral will? No. So then it's a non-moral decision we have to make. Then let's take the freedom that God has given us. Let's draw from those around us. Let's take the wisdom that God has given us and actually make a decision. How many of you struggle to make decisions? I've got a friend who his job is to make decisions. So I love going to him. What do you think we should do here? Dun, 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 dun. My decision would be this. Great decision. Sounds good. Sounds wise. Sometimes we put off making decisions just because we struggle in decision making. Look at this verse. James 1 verse 5 to 6 says, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as the wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in all they do. The first thing that I, I learned from this passage is he says, if you need wisdom, ask. He doesn't just say if you need a yes or no answer. Sometimes I wish he would write it in the sky and go, yes, no, hold, maybe. He says, if you need wisdom, if you need wisdom for you to make the right choices, ask me. I love that he says, if you want wisdom, ask. And he says, I will not rebuke you for asking. Isn't it great to know that he wants to see you make wise decisions and choices for your life? Isn't it great to know that God isn't just by your side, He is on your side, that He is for you, He wants to work all things to the good in your life, God is good. But then He says, but when you ask, be sure that your faith is in God alone, do not waver. And then He gives us an analogy of a wave. 
Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. And this um, being unstable talks about like the spiritual schizophrenia where one minute you're looking to God for wisdom and next minute you're looking to the world for wisdom. One minute you're saying, God, I want to live for you and the next minute you're looking to the things of the world, the things of the flesh and, and saying, I want to please you and I want to live for you. He talks about the doubter. He is unstable in all his ways. Um, this unstable talks about this violent storm. The doubter does not pray to God with a consistency and a sincerity of purpose. This person is prey to the shifting winds of motion and desire. He wants wisdom from God one day and then wisdom from the world the next. Proverbs 2 verse 6 says, the Lord gives wisdom. And I want to say to those that are looking for God's discernment in a decision to take this verse and say, God, I will run to you and I will seek your face. And I'll seek your, your face in that closed room and I'll bring this decision before you. I want your guidance. I want your leading. I want, you, I want to know your heart for the situation. I don't want to be tossed like a, like a wave, making a decision one day and then changing it the next and then knowing that I've got a peace and then it disappears because I've become so anxious and worked out and fearful that I lose that peace. I want to be sure in God's voice. I want to be sure in what God is saying to us. I want to be able to discern God's will. So a quick recap. First question that I want you to be able to ask is, what do I really want? Really? Am I seeking God's kingdom first or my own kingdom? Am I seeking all the other things that God said that he will provide when I seek his kingdom first? Have I asked for wisdom? Let me test you very quickly. What, what is the best question ever? In light of my past, in light of my present circumstance and situation, in light of my future hopes and dreams, my goals, my vision, my desires for my future, what is the wise thing to do? And then we trust that God would reveal His will. We trust that God would have His way. When Jesus said, not my will be done, your will be done. He said, pray like this, your kingdom come, your will be done. May we have this heart for the Lord that says, God, I want to be a father pleaser. I don't just want to live to please myself. So I want to invite the worship team back on stage, and I want us to pray a psalm. And I want to specifically pray the psalm over any person that is here today that is faced with a decision. Faced with a decision today, or they know that they are going to be faced with this decision that needs to may, be made in the next season. And I want to speak the psalm over you as though the Lord is speaking these words to you this morning. Psalm 32, verse 8 says, Sorry, I didn't finish that. Five questions. Have you received wise counsel? And then will I trust God in my decision? Won't you stand with me? Can I see by a little wave? Is there anyone here this morning trusting God for discernment when it comes to a decision that you have to make for your life, for your family, for your own life, whether it's starting a business or closing the business or moving house or getting married or... I want to pray this over you. Maybe you can just keep your hands lifted as just a, a sign of surrender. The Lord says this, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and I will watch over you. I want Father to say these words to you this morning, my son and my daughter, that I will guide you along the best paths for your life. You may not see it, it may not be clear, it may be hazy and dark, but I will guide you by my spirit, by my word, through my body of believers, that you would walk in the best paths that I have for you. 
my son and my daughter, I will advise you. I will give you the wisdom that you need. Ask, seek, believe. I will not rebuke you for asking, but I will advise you. And he says, I will watch over you. He says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never abandon you. I'll never allow that foolish decision to hijack the destiny and purpose that I have for your life. Well, I said that I will complete the work that I've started in you. 